Welcome. It's the uh, March 26th, and I've got Bruce Gagnon with me today for company. Welcome, Bruce. Hello. Good to see you, uh, Finian. Bruce Gagnon is a coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Uh, Bruce is an internationally recognized authority on subjects of international conflict and weapons proliferation. And um, he's also a quite a insightful critic of US foreign policy and imperialistic kind of behavior, uh, conduct. Um, Bruce, we'll just start with, uh, the, the, of course, in the, the, the um, aftermath of the big news of, of last Friday, this terror attack in Moscow, outside Moscow, which the death toll has now gone up to about 139, 140 people, probably a lot more to follow out of the seriously wounded. There's about 150 seriously wounded people. Um, Bruce, what's your take on that terror attack? Well, I think it's more the same. The You know, when the West loses wars, the US, UK, and its NATO allies, uh, when they keep losing wars, they turn to terrorism, chaos, uh, as a way to uh, continue, even though they're losing. And I think this is another example of that. I've noted that Pepe Escobar, George Galloway, Moon of Alabama, as well as uh, on RT and Sputnik, they're all pretty much saying that, and I think there's solid evidence behind it, that the UK, the US, Ukraine were really behind this whole operation. And then when Russia caught these uh, alleged terrorists uh, trying to escape, they were trying to get into to Ukraine. Uh, what, now, why would they be going there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was this Budinov and a couple of other, uh, Budinov is the head of the SBU, the Ukrainian equivalent of the CIA, and he and some other high-level Ukrainian intelligence people were saying, oh, this is good. This is a good thing. And uh, we need uh, to can you, we need to see more of this happening inside of Russia. Mm -hmm. And then let's not forget that Victoria Nuland was in Ukraine not that long ago, just a couple of weeks ago. And when she left on her way out, uh, before she left a press conference, she said Russia is in for some big surprises very soon. And then, of course, the U.S. State Department issued warnings to Americans inside of Russia saying, uh, don't go to any concerts in the next couple of weeks because we expect there's going to be some trouble. So I think when you add all these pieces together, it's pretty obvious that uh, that the U.K., the U.S., you know, I'm talking about MI6 here, the CIA and the uh, Ukrainian SBU, their CIA, uh, they were all involved in this. And in the reason why, again, is because they're losing the war. And the only thing they've got left is terrorism, and they're going to go with it. Yeah. I mean, Bruce, when you go back to the uh, Chechen war 20 years ago in the early 2000s, it was very well documented uh, that the U.S., the CIA, were supporting the the uh, separatists down there who the Russians were would designate as terrorists. So this and so very similar kind of uh, ideology, you know, this radical Islam or so-called radical Islam, and um, that the 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 latest attack involves. So there's a consistent pattern, a record there of of the U.S. and its NATO allies supporting these kind of um, radical groups, terrorist groups in Chechnya twenty years ago, and then in Syria and Libya. Um, over the last decade, um, so it's it's although the West is trying to um, paint the Russian claim of, of of bigger involvement than these radical Islamists, uh, the 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 West is trying to dismiss that as being Putin being paranoid and desperately kind of seeking to to involve the West. But the, the, if one is objective about the history of these kind of radical groups, you you have, one would recognize that the West has always had a, you know, an organizational, uh, a major organizational involvement, if not origin, originator involvement of these groups. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, the truth is we see the same story happening in Gaza today. Israel is using terrorism 
against the Palestinian people, not only in Gaza, but in the West Bank as well, where they're increasingly stealing land uh, to uh, hand over to the settlers, many of which come from the uh, United States. So it's really the same game. It's what they know and, uh, and what they're going to continue to do as long as they can get away with it. Bruce, what about the uh, the White House claim uh, or the, the official American claim that they would say, well, we alerted the Russian authorities on March 7 with this, um, you know, warning that was issued by the embassy in Moscow, the American embassy, that there was a, a danger, a risk of a terrorist attack. Now, they would claim that they were acting in good faith back in March, early March, by alerting this, uh, putting out this alert. So what, how, you know, then could that not be the case that the Americans, you know, were trying to alert their Russian, uh, you know, um, international partners as to a, a terror attack? I hadn't seen that, so I, I really can't respond to that. But I, I thought I had read earlier that the United States said that they never felt any uh, compunction to alert the uh, the Russian government. So mm -hmm. that's the only thing I had heard uh, that might have been outdated information, but uh, I didn't know that they had alerted them. And I would be skeptical that they had because it wouldn't have been in their interest if they were the ones organizing this event to start with. And we saw how quickly the West came out with, oh, it's it's ISIS that did this, you know, like within minutes almost, you know, right after the event happened. Now, how could they have known that, right? Uh, so clearly they, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to cover their tracks. Right. Bruce, we're kind of getting to the, the bigger topic here of the long war between the United States and its NATO allies and Russia, and we might we also add China here, that this battle going on, this war in Ukraine, it's a proxy war, but it's only one battlefield in a wider international confrontation between the United States, its NATO allies, Russia and China. Now, you posted a, a very interesting um, report just last week of a new base being under construction in Romania, it's going to be, it's said to be the biggest, will be the biggest NATO base in Europe when it's constructed. Now, it will be, won't be constructed uh, until, uh, I think, 2040. That's what they're saying. Um, so it's quite a few years away. But that would suggest that there's a, a big investment in military force right on Russia, in Russia's backyard. It, this base, I'll just try to do a, a call this your your uh, your report up here, Bruce, um, just for viewers to look at. I um, hope we can see that now, Bruce. This is your um, organizing notes site, and this is the report you got it from South Front, uh, but there's other sources to this report uh, that the NATO base is being built. I, I hope we can see that there. The, the base will be located at Constanta uh, on the Romanian Black Sea coast. From there to Sevastopol in Crimea is 400, less than 400 kilometers. Sevastopol being the um, Russian, the base for the Russian Black Sea Navy. Um, so it's, it's a major strategic location that this base is going to be um, can you? Oh, I was going to ask you to hold there for a moment, but uh, right, we'll go back to it, Bruce. Yeah, um, because just above that, in Ukraine, where look for Odessa on the map. Yes, Odessa. It's everyone sort of acknowledges that it's likely that Ukraine is going to lose Odessa, that Odessa is going to swing to uh, uh, rejoin Russia as well as the Donbass region, the eastern uh, Ukrainian region has also rejoined Russia as Crimea did as well. And so I'm sure that the Western and the NATO allies fear that if they lose Odessa uh, as a, a NATO uh, operational uh, position, 
they need to replace it with something. And that's why I think they're looking at Romania there and Constanta mm -hmm. to, to build this base. And as you say, the, its proximity to Crimea is uh, so evident. Mm -hmm. And th this they would be able to use that to continue firing drones and uh, and drone uh, boats, uh, you know, trying to take out Russian ships, trying to send uh, attacks on, onto the uh, Russian uh, military base there in Sebastopol. So uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be an ongoing struggle here. And this is what NATO wants. They want to bleed Russia just like they want to bleed China. And I think it's always, uh, it always comes back to the multipolar world, the creation of this multipolar world where the U.S. and the colonial powers in Europe of 500 years of colonial uh, control of the global south, much of the world, they're losing it. Mm -hmm. And they are afraid. How are they going to uh, get by? Where are they going to build their riches as they did over this past 500 years, especially in Europe? Uh, without the, without control of the global south. And so they're doing everything they can to try to slow down the creation of this multipolar world and also to try to uh, destabilize Russia and China to the point where uh, they fall apart, it, uh, that they, uh, uh, you know, uh, collapse, which is not going to happen. So uh, anyway, th this is the desperate Hail Mary pass, as they say in American football, Mm -hmm. I mean, just to, on that base, uh, Bruce, com at Constanta, it's a port city. I think there's a, already an existing small base there. So this is this is an expansion, according to the reports. Um, the 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 cost of this expansion is going to be two point five billion dollars. Um, it's going to be bigger when it's when it's operational. It's going to be bigger than the current. Uh, biggest base for NATO in Europe, which is Ramstein in Germany. So this is a major development. I mean, they're putting a lot of investment and um, strategic, financial, military uh, into this base. Um, it, it, it can't be overstated just how significant this new base is. And as you've pointed out, Bruce, it lies within very short firing range of the Russian uh, Black Sea Navy base in Sevastopol, uh, the Crimea Peninsula. Um, again, Bruce, just to emphasize this, as with the terror attack in Moscow, um, this is the West not letting go of the conflict with Russia. They're facing a defeat in Ukraine on the battlefield um, after the loss of that strategic city of Divka uh, in the east of Ukraine there uh, last month. Uh, the Russians seem to be rolling across the, 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 the that eastern Ukraine to, to take the, the, the territory that they set out to take. Um, the, the, uh, the, the ethnic Russian population that uh, lives in that area to protect it. Um, so the, the NATO proxy war seems to be lost. But what you're saying is that the, they're this is this is only just the beginning of a, a longer struggle. That's right. And and one that can get real hot real quick, because if they do uh, follow through and finish building this base and it be, becomes an aggressive uh, base towards Russia, Russia will have to respond. And at that point in time, uh, because it would be a NATO base, right? With NATO troops, it would be there. NATO Navy, NATO, NATO Air Force, maybe NATO Marines, Army, what, etc. Uh, then uh, we could really be into World War Three. I mean, we're hanging on the edge of it right now, on the edge of World War Three between U.S. and the NATO allies, the U.K., U.S., and uh, the whole schmear. But uh, it's just one tragic uh, decision after the other that the Western powers continue to throw down, you know, in the face of, of Russia mm -hmm. and increasingly in, in the face of China too. And um, what, what, kind of, what kind of weapons do you, do you envisage they have got lined up for that base in uh, that new base in Romania on the Black Sea coast? What, what kind of weapons, missiles, uh, 
long range uh, aircraft bombers or who knows uh but i think you have to assume everything uh because they they would be so close to russia it would be so tempting to put uh the most aggressive long range weapon systems possible there mm -hmm. so uh, i think they would uh, look to do that yeah and and you know the us already has nuclear weapons in germany belgium italy they're moving them back into England. I'm missing one other country. Uh, but anyway, wh why not put them there too in Romania, you know? Uh, so I, I think it would be an another red line for Russia if they did. Well, it does make a mockery of the um, the NATO claims. They're sort of sheepish claims that they're, they're not a threat to Russia, that NATO does not present a threat to Russia, but yet they're they're about to build a massive base uh, 400 kilometers from russian territory uh, that's bigger than the existing mega base in germany ramstein so um it does tend to make their kind of um claims of innocence rather absurd if not kind of um contemptible um bruce let's again on this bigger picture of, of a longer war um I mean, I think that terror attack in, in Moscow is quite uh, appropriate to that bigger picture uh, in that if, if if the West is behind that terror attack, which seems quite plausible, it's, it's a sign that they're not letting go of Russia. They've got Russia in their sights. And if they can't win it through a conventional military battle in Ukraine, they're going to use all sorts of um, hybrid methods of ter state-sponsored terrorism. Um, We'll, we'll just go on then, Bruce, to the, to your latest trip to Korea. I, I believe you're you're just back from a, a trip to Korea, and you you'd um, you've got some news or reports on on developments there with um, U.S. militarism on that peninsula. Yeah, I I uh, just two two weeks two and a half weeks ago, I I did a ten city uh, speaking tour, starting in Jeju Island an island uh, just south of the Korean Peninsula, where the U.S. forced a Navy base to be constructed as part of its pivot to Asia during the Obama administration, Hillary Clinton's famous pivot. They need more, uh, war, uh, more ports for warships. They need more airfields for airplanes. They need more barracks for troops. So like in uh, Darwin, Australia, they're building, uh, they or have built new barracks for Marines that are being prepositioned there. So in Jeju Island, South Korea, they built this Navy base. And in fact, just last week uh, was the uh, 12th year of remembering that the coastal region, the rocky coast of uh, Kongjong Village on Jeju Island, a 500 year old fishing and farming community, uh, had been uh, blown up. The rocky coast had been blown up. The sacred place, they called it Gurumbi Rock, where they worshipped their dead relatives for those 500 years. It was blown up and concrete was poured on it to build the, the uh, docks for the Navy base. So I started my tour there and uh, Jeju is now being turned into a, a space base as well. Uh, the U.S. is dragging South Korea into the space warfare program, and the Hanwha Corporation, the uh, Korean corporation, is building a space center there on Jeju Island. They're going to set up a satellite production center to build military satellites and a satellite launch facility as well. Mm -hmm. And so the people on Jeju that I've been friends with for many years, they they know about our space work. In fact, they've they invited uh, us to hold our annual meeting one year there some years ago uh, when this base Navy base was just being first constructed. And so they've followed the space issue very closely and that they now see what's happening, that they're being dragged into it. So they invited me to come and tour the country to alert others uh, across the country. So my tour started there and it went on to other, other uh, places in the country where U.S. has bases and, uh, and, and also communities where 
other kinds of uh, facilities are being built. And I'll just touch on a couple real quick. Uh, there are two places I went where uh, new runways are being expanded, uh, runways are being expanded on present U.S. Air Force bases in order to uh, allow the U.S. to have more planes, uh, especially on the western side of the Korean Peninsula, which is the closest side to China. Mm -hmm. And in order to do this, they're having to take fishing villages, uh, pristine uh, uh, mud flats and uh, tid uh, tidal areas, uh, where endangered species live, particularly endangered birds. So there's struggles going on in those communities over that. Uh, in a place called Camp Humphreys, an army base, an hour and a half south of the capital in Seoul, uh, it, it, uh, 10 years ago, they started a campaign to remove 71 farming villages near Camp Humphreys. And it was a 10-year struggle. The people were ultimately defeated and they've now expanded Camp Humphreys and they've closed the army base inside of Seoul called Youngson. And uh, it was contaminating the living hell out of the water supply in Seoul. So th they wanted them out of Seoul. Plus it made Seoul a prime target in, in a war with North Korea. So anyway, they moved the base down to Camp Humphreys to, in the city of Pyeongtaek. And they now, as I said, they took 71 farming villages and they already their people there are suffering major environmental consequences. But also in the same city of Pyeongtaek, the U.S. has an air base called Osan Air Force Base, and it has already created the first overseas Space Force unit of the United States, and they're now bringing South Korea into the Space Force program. Uh, so they're asking South Korea to help pay for the creation of the architecture, the infrastructure for this whole U.S. Star Wars program, because mm -hmm. it's so expensive. Industry publications have been saying for many years that this program will be the largest industrial project in the history of the planet Earth. Well, the U.S. is $35 trillion in debt today. It can't afford to build this thing anymore. So it's going out now around the world and asking the allies to help build a piece of it and to help build some of the satellites, to help do some of the launching, all to create this, this architecture, this hardware. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. would remain in charge of the tip of the spear. And so as I was going around the country, I'm seeing all these signs in South Korea of how this is being developed, being set up, being sold to the Korean taxpayers as exciting uh, space adventure. We're going out to look for the origins of life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be so wonderful and it's going to create lots of jobs and it's not going to have any environmental impact and it's going to be fun. Oh, my God, it's going to be so fun. But what's really underlying all this is that lower Earth orbit is the place where the United States is putting many of these satellites that are part of this space warfare program, because all, all warfare on the Earth today is coordinated by space technology. But as it turns out, lower Earth orbit, LEO as they call it, is becoming increasingly crowded. It's like a parking lot at a supermarket. There's not many parking spaces left. And Russia and China are getting a little bit agitated. Russia's only got 200 and some satellites up there. The United States has literally thousands. And Elon Musk is putting Starlink up there. He's already got an authorization to put like 20,000 satellites up there. And it's been acknowledged that Musk is providing Ukraine with Starlink capability that they then use to target Russia. So a lot of these drone attacks and other attacks deep inside of Russia are being directed by the Starlink satellites. So whoever controls lower Earth orbit, fills up lower Earth orbit, is going to have the advantage, right? High ground always has advantage in war. You're going to be able to see everything, hear everything, and target everything on the Earth. And so this is creating a whole new competition and tension between the U.S. 
and Russia and China. And so all of this then is what I talked about on that Korean tour. But one other thing I want to bring up in a town of Imwa, a little small uh, farming community, uh, suddenly they now have a cluster bomb factory being uh, built there. And as it turns out, they're building cluster bombs for the United States, who then turns them over to guess who, Ukraine and Israel. And so at this little village, uh, they took me there to meet with the village leaders, the village people. Uh, they're uh, opposing this, but they've been told, shut the hell up and go along with the show. Right, right. Which is kind of a, you know, ironic because the, the Americans in the West would be Kind of accusing North Korea of supplying weapons to to Russia, but to, from what you're saying, the the South Koreans are very busily helping to supply the the NATO war in Ukraine. Um, so so Bruce, from what you're saying, there there, there seems to be a, a very intensive effort by the United States to remilitarize the Korean Peninsula. That's right, and it's it's big time. Yeah. It is really, really big time. And just kind of uh, recapitulate for for me and for anybody listening, how does this fit into the war in Ukraine and U.S. kind of conflictual relations with China? How, where does the Korea military operations fit in? Well, I think I think the look for me the largest picture. Uh, uh, my I blogged every day that I was there. I posted a different article every day on my blog uh, about this trip, about each of the stops I made. And one of the final ones I, I did was called South Korea, and then in parentheses, NUS, as a permanent war economy. And we're saying that, hearing the same thing now out of Europe. We hear that uh, from the EU, them talking about really, we've got to ramp up our spending on the military. We've got to uh, build more technology. We've got to build, you know, all kinds of more weapons because uh, we can't let Russia win this thing. And so the U.S. and its allies are on a permanent war uh, economy footing. And uh, so whether it's South Korea or whether it's Germany or Italy or UK or anybody else uh, in Europe. They're all moving in this same direction. Japan uh, doing the same thing, you know. And so, again, this indicates that the U.S. can't afford to pay for its global war machine aimed at Russia and China, but they're still committed to it. So mm -hmm. what they've done very astutely, they put in place in the leadership positions, the political leadership positions of all the ally countries, or most of them anyway, and so, you know, Harvard, Yale graduates, probably somehow connected through George Soros and the CIA, uh, get elected in their particular European country, whether it's Moldova or whether it's Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, you know, uh, I, uh, you know, Annalena Baerbock, a foreign minister in Germany, she went to a uh, school in Orlando, Florida when she was in high school as a, you know, a student and uh, come to find out, I, I'm very familiar with this school because I used to live there for 20 years in Orlando and my office was inside the Quaker Meeting House and right across the street was this school that Annalena Baerbach went to and it's a well-known Christian fundamentalist school, you know. So almost all of these uh, European politicians have been put through the training program, if you will. In, right. of indoctrination and then they go into their country and at the right time it's almost like uh what do they call those uh, hidden squads you know hidden hidden units inside of political sleeper cells yeah yeah there you go yeah. uh, so at the at the right moment they all kind of come out you know into the public and and they're controlling all these countries and they're all agreeing that yeah we've got to ramp things up we got we can't let russia win this war we've got to increase our military spending and everything else so that's the game right now cutbacks in social spending cutbacks in environmental spending cutbacks in needed infrastructure 
spending, you know, what for whether it's electrical or, you know, uh, water or, you know, uh, sewer, whatever, you know, whatever is needed in a particular country, but cutbacks and all those uh, needed services, while at the same time increasing the, the uh, war economy of all these nations, that's what we're facing. Yeah. Well, sir, Bruce, I mean, uh, certainly that's, I think that's a, a common perception over in Europe that the political leadership in these capitals in Europe are completely divorced from the feelings of, or the needs or the interests or the concerns of ordinary Europeans. The question is, like, who are these people? What, 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 what is making them take this crazy um, pro-war, pro-NATO, pro-American agenda that's completely seems like um, divorced from the needs of ordinary European people. So there's questions. It, it might be a good story for you to consider looking into uh, and writing about, you know, picking out four or five of them and highlighting their backgrounds, you know, uh, the so links to Soros, links to, you know, Harvard and Yale that are notorious CIA recruiting schools and all that kind of thing, you know, because I'm... I'm Thanks for the prompt on Annalena Baerbach, Baerbach the uh, German foreign minister. I didn't realize she had that educational background in the United States, but it certainly is consistent with her very um, servile mentality towards uh, Washington's geopolitical needs. Bruce, we're nearly out of time. And um, just before we run out of time totally, I just want to put it to you, uh, given the the uh, forthcoming out. Uh, U.S. presidential election. Um, you know, I, I have to ask you. I mean, it, one would one would deduce from what you're saying that really the the election of of a, the president of of the United States is pretty irrelevant. Really, it, I mean, let's be specific here. Trump, Donald Trump, the Republican candidate, has been talking about getting out of NATO, making peace with Russia. I think even recently he's been talking about making peace with China, even though he's been a, a very uh, strong, uh, you know, belligerent, you know, in his previous uh, administration, he was very belligerent towards China. Anyway, um, all this talk about, you know, from Trump that he would do this and that towards, you know, trying to uh, uh, improve relations. What you're saying, the bigger picture, the, the juggernaut, Kind of development, NATO expansion, militarization of the peninsula of Korea um, would indicate that really the, the 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 presidential candidates, what they say is quite irrelevant to what is being actually the policy that's being laid down by the state planners, the unelected government within the United States. Would that that's be a fair right. comment? Yeah. Uh, you know, I turned to Colonel Douglas McGregor on this. He was a uh, tank commander uh, and uh, he worked in his retirement on, he worked as an advisor for Donald Trump in his first term as president. And McGregor has become very critical now of what he calls the uniparty. He says there are there is only one party in America today and it's a corporate run party. You know, Mussolini, the Italian World War II leader, uh, he called fascism the wedding of corporations and government. And isn't that what we have today in the United States and throughout most of Europe? I think it is. And so I think Colonel McGregor is right. He's now saying that if Trump is elected, nothing will change. He, you know, Trump was president. He had a ample opportunity to do lots of things and he didn't do any of them he talks a good line talks about nato but he didn't really do much other than uh, put pressure on the nato members to pay more that's one thing he did do uh, but other than that uh, i don't expect donald trump to do anything and on israel he's terrible yeah well that that base in this new base that they're building on the black sea coast uh, in constant Constanta in uh, Romania, uh, the, going to be the biggest NATO base in Europe, uh, surpassing the Ramstein base in Germany. Um, I mean, this that really uh, tells you everything about what the long term outlook and planning is. It's for more war, uh, more aggression towards Russia. Um, 
and uh, unfortunately uh, that's that's the kind of world we're, we're living in being dictated to by the corporate uh, you know military fascist uh, power complex um Bruce Canyon, thanks very much. Uh, any any last word there from you, Bruce? Would you like to say sorry? Well, I would just say it. Someone ought to look into the Romanian leadership and see how they're connected to this whole thing, mm -hmm. financially, politically, except and you know historically. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, I I read your columns all the time, uh, all and appreciate your work very much. Bye bye. Thanks, for, thanks very much, Bruce. Bye bye. Thank you.